Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to uh, uh, another episode of Bob and Chad, uh, Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. We had a little delay there. We had to watch the finish of the Daytona 500 first. So now we're on live and all ready to go. So what's new and exciting at Weir's Machine, Chad? Oh, another busy Monday kicking off a new week here. We Every Monday we do our meetings and go over everything that all our production team and assembly and and marketing and everything that needs to go. So Mondays are somewhat stressful with meetings for me in the morning, but uh, we got a lot of planning going on for the, the trade show in Rochester on March 9th. That's coming together well. We got uh, 40 vendors signed up, so we're getting uh, we're getting a really good show together for that. Excited for that. It's a one day one day trade show at the Mayo Civic Center there, Saturday, March 9th, nine to four. So looking forward to that. You know, getting ready for the race season. It'll be a couple weeks before we start, and everybody can come and check out the new stuff. And we're gonna have some pretty big companies there, so we're excited. If you haven't followed followed along on the Midwest Motorsports Expo, make sure you follow that and. Colby's been doing the vendor spotlights, keeping every up to everybody up to date on who's coming, and so we're really uh, we're planning for that. Last weekend we had three and one, so me and Colby and uh, Justin and my son were up debuting our Trick Outdoors brand up north with our uh, hunting line at the Duluth Sports Show, and our new uh, we built an E Wyatt, so an electric mountain bike kind of for hunting and. So we launched all that last week there, and then we had Billy down at Carl Performance and Josh at Mill Hamilton Ford. So the factory support team's been busy. We're uh, we're getting aggressive, and we're getting out there and, and trying to see the people. Well, that sounds good. It uh, sounds like you had an exciting weekend. Uh, wasn't the case here. It was a relatively boring weekend with all the rain. I didn't get to watch any of the Daytona races. And... Uh, now I'm trying to decide whether I want to stay up late and watch the Xfinity race tonight. I I, I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. The Daytona 500 just got over, so that was cool. But otherwise, we've been busy. The shop's been busy. We've been busy, and the shop room has been busy. So we've been going along pretty good. Everything's going good. And can't complain. Hopefully, we're on the right channel. Uh, I think we are shows that on my computer we are so hopefully that's okay and like i said we uh nothing else super new we've got um the class this weekend uh, we got our stock car class this weekend which we still have some openings in case somebody wants to uh, uh, join in there we've got that and it's also going to be streamed on racetechinfo.tv and IMCA TV. So it's going to be streamed. So if, if you can't watch it, I mean, if you can't come, you can still definitely attend online. Um, we got a, a couple new interns that are doing some of our media stuff. So we're on TikTok now, which, you know, I'm not much into that stuff, so I wouldn't know what that really means, but it's at bobharrisent.com, I guess. And uh, that's about the extent of what I uh, I can tell anybody. Can't wait for racing season to get going. It's, you know, boy, it's not going to be long. And the 1st of April is going to be here. And so that's going to be good. You know, the frost busters will be coming up pretty good. I think, I think it's like April 6th is the frost buster of Boone. So hopefully we'll have this summer weather that we're having. Like today, I think it was like 55 degrees down here. So I'm hoping we have all the summer weather the 1st of April instead of having the 1st of April be a rain fest. Not that we don't need the rain. The lakes definitely need the rain. But anyway, so if anybody's got any questions, um, We don't have a lot of viewers, so I'm not really sure what that means. If, They're all watching you know, the Daytona 500. <laughs> I suppose they probably are, yeah. 
No doubt about that. Anything new and exciting? How's that uh, that new machine that you got going for setting the trading rooms? How's that been selling? Yeah, the new uh, rigid measuring plate's been going pretty good. Yeah, it's uh, we're going to extend it by one inch coming up here pretty soon to give it a little bit more range so you can put the front steering arms on there. Um, but that'll be uh, a nice little addition too. So get that 19 in there if you want to do that. You'd have to move the post, so I wasn't all about that, but some guys want to be able to do that. So, okay. you know, if, you're, if, you're two, if your rear four-link bars are both 15s and 17s, then you could have a 19 and a half and a 19 for your your front uh, tie rods. So, oh, that'd be good. We're good at listening to the people and, and making an adaption, and, you know, uh, alterations as we move forward and, you know, the innovation comes from the people, so you got to listen to what they want. Sure. So. Yeah, the end user is the one that actually ends up knowing. You know, we tried out that lower A frame checker on the stock car, and it works perfectly fine on the stock car, just like it does on the modified. Cool. So we tried that out uh, Friday. We had a um, Brayton stock car in there, all lettered up. Well, that thing turned out really good. He did an awesome job on it. And, that thing is, it, it looks pretty spiffy. We gave him a bad time because he didn't put all of the bends in the doors. And I was asking if that was an indication of what was to come. So he didn't have as much to straighten or what the deal was. And he didn't really say for sure. But because, you know, the, all that racing can be kind of a contact sport, I guess. We must not be on right because Amy just asked if we were what's going on. Oh. Well. According to this that I would know about, it says that we're supposed to be on. Oh, maybe. Um, Amy says she needs to find it. Yeah, we must not be on right. Well, we're on live now at the BHE Fab page. So hopefully, if uh, everybody's out there and about, and we're sorry, we uh, I'm not really sure what happened there. This, uh, be live studio program that we use is kind of a pain in the butt, and we're going to have to come up with a different, some sort of different solution. I'm not sure what other people use, but we're going to have to find that out. Because basically, this is the same thing as a uh, podcast, isn't it, Chad? Yeah, pretty much, but I'm not sure why that uh, destination of the other page ain't showing up. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. I, I, I wouldn't have a clue. Would not have a clue. I, I used to be pretty good at the computer stuff, and then I got to the point where I had other people take care of it. And now I kind of forgot about it. And, and it's needless to say, the problem with uh, the, the good side of having college interns is you get a lot of new ideas and you get a lot of fresh stuff and everything. The problem is, is you just get used to how things are going and then they graduate from school and, and away they go. So they start over. And, and like I said, it's not that we don't have good kids because they, they, they all do a good job. It's just uh, now, now I'm going to have to have somebody learn this program and decipher what what I did wrong or what what actually happened. I'm not really sure, but whatever. So we don't have any questions yet. Probably might not have any questions. Is there anybody watching? Is it, we got 10 people, it says. All right, here we go. Yeah. So it'll be, be a big night, I'm sure. Right? But 
So 40 vendors, that's pretty good. Yeah, March 9th, Rochester Mayo Civic Center. 9 to 4, Midwest Motorsports Expo. Uh, we've been uh, planning pretty hard with Josh Ruby from Kevco's working on it. Colby's been working on it here. So uh, if you're looking for something to do there that March 9th, there's going to be 40 vendors there. We're talking big companies in the racing industry, all circle track stuff. So we're excited to get this kind of regional show going. We got people coming from all over the country, reps from all over big com big companies so make sure you like that facebook the midwest motorsports expo and follow along and uh, we hope to see everybody there nine to four. Oh yeah one guy signed in actually that's a pretty this is exciting now all right yeah so and then of course the following week after that the 15th and 16th we go to uh, pennsylvania out to close racing supply and do a seminar out there. Joel does a good job. He's got an awesome facility. And uh, uh, Steve says it's a good starting point for a Panard bar. Okay. What would you like to know about a Panard bar? He said IMCA Sportman. IMCA Sportman. Oh, gotcha. Um, well, what I've always done, like on the rear end itself, I measure from the center of the axle housing down three and a half inches, and that's my base setup. And then my slick setup is down four inches, so I only drop it a half an inch for when the racetrack gets real slick. Now on the uh, on the uh, frame. I usually go about three inches above the center of the housing, so we end up having six inches of rake in the thing, basically, and that's a good starting point, and then I adjust it by half an inch for a slippery stretch, so that's pretty good. The other thing, of course, with that panard bar being behind the housing, and you can tune with that a little bit, you know, you can shorten that, because we can't, with an IMCA sport mod, you can't use wheel spacers, so you can always tune with that uh, panard bar by moving the rear end right to left. You move it to the right, it loosens the car up. You move it to the left, it tightens the car up. But when we're talking about moving it, we're only talking about a quarter of an inch max, an eighth of an inch most of the time, and a quarter of an inch max. So that's a pretty good starting sport, spot. Um, and if you're wanting to know how, I always line up my left side tires so that you know if you're waiting wanting to know a good starting point left to right i always line up my left side tires so that they're in line the string line them in line and then that's where i set my panard bar to start with aaron says chad could you please take your uh, wm448 rear end measurement tool and make one that snaps on the drive shaft to help me set the rear end left to right that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good idea, Aaron. I see only one option where one problem would be how many different diameters would we need to, to fit all the different drive shafts when you go steel and aluminum and carbon, and there'd probably be a bunch of different ones there. So maybe a V or something like that we could do. So I'll maybe sketch something up and work on that. That's uh, not a bad idea. I mean, if it's on a V and you get it square to the world, it would still be centered. So good idea. We'll, uh, we'll write that down and work on that. Uh, Mike wants to know, on a 19 GRT three-link car, solid pull bar like a sport mod, but springs can be in front, rear, or top, and I can run a J-bar, where's the best location for the rear springs? Well, probably my opinion would be having the uh, left rear in front of the housing and the right rear on top of the housing would probably be my favorite uh, where I think you would get the maximum traction out of the rear end because as the rear end steers forward, it would load that left rear spring and, and load that left rear tire a little bit more uh, than what it does with it being uh, on top of the housing. Uh, so I, I think that's a pretty good idea. Um now, I don't know if your rules allow you to run a uh, uh, – my brain just went dead um, – a slider. 
that's definitely what you're going to want to run if you want if you're going in front you're going to definitely want to run it on a slider that's going to be the easiest way to locate it so i think that would be my suggestion i think i like that idea um daughter is going to race sport mod at marshalltown at boone this year what gear set for these racetracks uh, late steve um you know, I'm not sure I'm the right guy to actually ask on those gear sets for those sport mods. Uh, I know at once upon a time, it was pretty common to run like a 567 at Marshalltown and a 583 at Boone. But I don't know. I'm pretty sure that's with a crate motor, but don't quote me on that. Let me, uh, somebody else that's probably listening can pop in here and, and give us their opinion. Uh, that seems to me what I remember hearing, but I don't know if that's what they're still doing or not. Uh, yeah, there you go. Good, good question, Cole. I should have mentioned that, or I should have thought of that. Uh, did you want an open or a crate motor? Yeah, that's a big difference. About twenty points in gear, if I remember right, but. Hopefully, so Steve, we need to know if you're running an open motor or a crate motor. So what's been happening at Weir's Machine? Anything exciting? Another busy Monday, managing chaos, getting ready for, we recapped all our shows from last weekend. We had three shows in one weekend. We had Billy down at Carl Performance and Josh was at Mill Hamilton Ford in Kansas, and then me and the Mason and the boys in the marketing, Justin and Colby, were up in Duluth at the outdoor show, debuting our our new Trick Outdoors brand and our, our brand new uh, Wyatt e hunting bike. So it was a big weekend for the company. We burned down a lot of diesel this weekend running around the country. Awesome. Well, that's good. If you uh... Well, good, Cole. I'm glad you said that. I, I, 583 and the 567, that's what I thought that I remembered, but I wasn't super sure. Uh, Ryan, two questions on the right rear four link. First is what is a good starting point? What's a good starting point for the drop on the shock mount of the birdcage? And second, what, or second, would there be any advantage to running zero indexing on the right rear to keep the right rear from indexing out of the spring as the right rear climbs up off the corner. What's your opinion on that, Chad? I don't know. I've had I've had a couple people get zero index plates for the right rear. I haven't run it in the Ultra Force software to see uh, where you would need to position to actually do that as you climb. Um, you know, the right rear doesn't move nearly as much as the left rear so the benefit you're going to get is going to be minimal um but yeah definitely something you could probably try um as far as the shock drop i like to keep the right rear uh at a six inch drop on the front and the left rear at a seven behind so one inch split in the shock mounts tends to be the the most normal spot on the cage location but that zero indexing, you know, as you climb, I've, I've not played with that, but I have had a couple of people get zero index cages for the right rear. But then, of course, you know, they never give you any intel on where they were. So haven't played with any at all myself, so I don't know if there's any gain there or not. I would think it would be somewhat minimal because when you watch the videos of the right rear, it, it really doesn't move. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's really no not a lot of action i mean it goes up and down to a point but not nothing like what the left rear does yeah uh terry hobby stock type car with no weight jacks is a 16 inch left rear spring the way to go to not being able to crank down on the spring well the problem terry you're going to want to run well of course if you're you said hobby stock type car so that must mean it might not be an IMCA stock car because, of course, you've got they've got new rules on frame heights and stuff. So you got to be careful what you do with spring rate, you know, spring rates on that. Um, but if there is no rule 
height wise, I would definitely go with a 16 inch screen because it just gets it's more travel and and uh, you can go with a softer spring and load the spring up a little bit more to get a little bit more action up off the corner. And I think that would be be something to consider. What's your thoughts, Chad? Yeah, I don't know much about the hobby stock stuff. I'm not real real strong on knowledge on that stuff. I, I listen to it because I got uh, Braden kind of takes care of all our hobby stock customers and, and uh, I don't pay as much attention during the day what's going on with the hobby stock stuff. I see my little homie Pace Herrera won. I might have to pick his brain on his setup. There you go. <laughs> he did win, did he? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that was pretty cool. You skipped, uh, I think you skipped Les and Jim. They popped in as they were sliding there. Oh, okay. Um, when setting rear steer in a USRA modified, how much rear steer do you start with on a baseline setup? Um, on our stuff, we usually are in that three inch range. Um, kind of depends, you know. Every car's got its sweet spot. So, you know, our three inch might be your two and three quarters. You, know, you just kind of got to go by what the car tells you um, as far as a baseline. But I mean, I would think if you're in that two and three quarters to three inch mark, I, I don't think you'd be too far off offline. Uh, that's where our stuff usually runs. Uh, Jim, on upper A frames on a B mod, on the swedge tube with the clevis by the ball, do you want the clevis loose enough to move or tighten it all the way down? I would tighten it all the way down because the only reason you want that clevis in there is basically it's just an easy way to mount that upper control arm. I mean, because you don't want that control arm. You don't want that ball joint housing moving back and forth. You want the ball joint to do all the housing. So I would tighten it down. On a metric stock car spindle, is there a geometry difference or advantage between the OEM and the two-piece spindle? Um, I wouldn't say that there's a, any geometry advantage with that stock spindle compared to the two-piece because as far as I'm understanding from what I know about the stock car stuff the it's it's basically a replacement for the stock spindle so in, in my opinion that stock car spindle and that three-piece um, spindle should be the same Same piece. Now, there could be something that I don't know, but I I don't think so. I mean, if, when that all came about, it was basically because the shortage of trying to find aftermarket or the OEM parts in the salvage yard was getting very tough to find those 78, to 78 79, and 80 uh, metric stuff. So they came out with a replacement. Stock car school this weekend. Stock car school is this weekend. Um, we still have some spots available. If anybody still wants to come, it's not a problem. It's this coming weekend, Friday and Saturday. Uh, it's also, if you can't come, um, it's going to be streamed live on racetechinfo.tv and IMCA TV. So definitely... Uh, you got your two options there. You can still join in. Um, we'll send you the book. So you have the book, the same book as you would get in the class if you take it online. So the only difference in taking it, the only difference in taking it online versus in how or in the school itself is, you know, you don't, you know, you, just, you don't have the, you know, the, the interaction with the rest of the classmates. But the advantage to taking it online is you get to watch it for 
360 days. Um, you can watch it as many times as you want to. I mean, you can go over and over and over and over. You can watch different chapters and, and stuff like that. So it's, that's a pretty neat deal online. Um, Les, when you say two and three quarters to three inches of rear steer, do you take into account the right rear moving backwards or figure that's into the overall steer droop? Um, I don't actually take that into account. I just actually measure the left rear and what the actual left. Well, no, actually, that's wrong. I'm sorry. I take that into account when the right rear moves back and the left rear moves ahead, what that combination of both of those are. So your total amount of steer at droop would be two and three quarters to three inches. And like I said, the best way to actually um, do that is if you take a, you know, take the right front spring out and drop it on the ground. So it's up against the lower control arm jack up underneath the seat until the chain's tight and then put a ratchet strap down and, and compress the right rear an inch and then uh, you can measure what the steer actually is that way pretty easy and you're going to be pretty pretty darn close i mean that's going to give you it's not a pull down rig but it's a poor man's pull down rig yeah when they say that their races are won and lost in the shop spending that time getting the data from the racetrack you know painting your shock shafts getting your travels understanding how far your car is traveling dynamically and taking that and then pushing it down to them numbers you know on the shock shafts getting them numbers and being able to go to the shop and put your car at dynamic and just take a pile of notes like just as many measurements as you can and understand exactly what you got going on dynamically you'd be surprised when you start spending the time, what you will learn. When I, when I was crew chief and back in the day, the asphalt cars went from doing everything at ride height to everything dynamically. Now they do, they set all them cars up dynamically. And the dirt world's kind of going that way too, where you got to see what that car's doing in the middle of the corner, in the center of the corner. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, at the flag stand, I don't really care what it's doing. It's going straight. So, yeah, you know, the races are won and lost in phase two, as Bob preaches in his school, and that's where... When that car is at its max attitude, that's when you need to figure out, you know, what your toe is, what your bump is, what your trail is, all that stuff, all your four bar angles. You'd be surprised the caster camber gains and things you would learn just by building a massive notebook. You know, that's unreal. you have to understand all that stuff to excel your program. And you do because, you, you, you know, when you're making a change now, you've got an educated idea of what's going on because you got the notes there in front of you well if i'm if i do this if i make this measurement it's going to do this 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 and this and that's where you get you know like chad said that's that that notebook deal man there's it's priceless totally priceless the guys that are out there winning races every night they're not winning races every night just for shits and giggles. I mean, they're, they're they're putting the work into it. They know what the car is going to do. They know what adjustments going to do to the car, you know. And we teach you a lot of that stuff in the school. But you know, like Chad said, you know, the phase two is where that car. That's that's where the race is going to be won in phase two. And I can't stress enough the fact that man, just learn your race car. Your race car will tell you everything that you want it to tell you. You just have to learn what it's telling you. Um, Les says, Chad, in the three or four inch load number on the right front, do you try to be in that 1350 to 1400 range? And also, do you account for the load at static? So what we just what I just talked about is all that dynamic number. The load stick is one of the key ingredients to getting that data. You know, when you win a race uh, and you're really good that night, you're going to want to know what your center to center was at that feature time so that you can go and push the car down and get that center to center and put the load stick on there and find out, oh, I, was, I won the feature, pulling away, it was dry slick right front at three and a quarter of travel was 1,350 pounds. And that needs to be documented. As that spring fades, as certain things wear out, as a ball joint's bent, 
as something gets bent, you can always put that stick on there and go back to that reference and know if something is wrong. That stick is like, it's made, you know, so many leaps and bounds as far as, you know, what you can gather data when you're, when you're really good and when you suck. As far as a magical number, I don't have a magical number because what works in a Rage is different than a GRT. It's different than a BHE. It's different than the, the shock mount variance is so drastic on that load stick, you know, that you have to, that's where when we preach, watch your own Bob or stain your own notebook, you're using these tools to build your own data for your car, listening to your driver and listening to your shock guy and your chassis builder to make your program better. You don't worry about what Steve's got over there. You worry about what you got. So as far as a magic number, you know, I don't know if there is a magic number, you know, that you can just say, oh, put it at 1400 and you're going to win the feature. Not going to happen. So the dynamic number mixed with your ride height number, when you scale, you're going to have your center to centers. So you're always going to use that static number when you're changing springs at the track so that you can change accurately. Once you get your car ready to go and you have your center to centers, you're going to have that stick. You're going to go to your ride height center to center, write that down. You get to the racetrack, need to change the spring, springs out, new springs in, stick is on, center to center, set the load, go to the speedway. Back in the old days, man, we had to take measurements and shake the car, and we never knew what the heck we had because we were basically winging it. You know, you were trying to get it as close as you could, but the load sticks have really evolved the whole tuning at the track and making sure that your setup is perfect exactly how you scaled every time you go to the speedway. Good point. That was, that was very well taken. And, 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 uh, and once again, we can't stress that fact. And, you know, get your own notebook and just stay in your own notebook, follow your notebook, develop your notebook. I mean, the car's going to tell you everything that you want it to tell you. You just have to learn what it's telling you. Uh, Chris, when switching from a 16-inch 150 left rear spring to an 18-inch 100-pound spring, should I change the rate of my 200-pound right rear spring? Uh, IMCA modifying. Um, well, not. I normally don't. Um, you know, going to that 100-pound spring is definitely going to free the car up a little bit more because you're going to have a little bit more load in that spring. But you're probably going to end up having to maybe make a, a slight panard bar adjustment or a trailing arm adjustment a little bit. But I wouldn't change my right rear spring. I, I would, you know, um, you're running the 200-pound spring. You know, in the IMCA world, it's pretty common. Uh, you know, we run a 225, uh, and that's with a, an 80 pound spring. So, um, you know, now are we fast all the time? No, wish we were, but I don't think the springs have anything to do with it. So, that's my opinion. What's the reasoning to running the rear axle seals and grease various oil bath rear hubs? Just less mess? Um, <laughs> well, less mess is always good. I don't know if, you know, I can't really tell you what the advantage would be other than the fact that you're just, you know, keeping those bearings lubricated. Yeah, I mean, if the if the axle seal isn't in there and the centrifugal force is taking the grease out of the rear end, probably not a good situation. No, I, I wouldn't. I was random so. to keep the grease in the center section. But. Yeah, I wouldn't say so because all that's going to do is lube up your brakes, and that's going to be a problem. So, so I don't know if I answered your question, but. Uh, I, I I think I would run the seals. We've always run the seals. And I'm not 
and as far as uh, on the actual bearing seals in the rear end, you know, we run the standard standard seals. I don't run the light, the low drag seals because I don't think they seal as good. Same with that axle seal. I, I run just a standard axle seal that fits the axle real well. Now, it's a little trickier with some of the, um, uh, the new style axles, but the majority of the axles is you know, fine. Uh, what's the curl measurement? Off the bench for a Chevelle lower control arm, it's five and a quarter inches. They'll vary uh, an eighth of an inch. Uh, a lot of times, you know, the new ones are, I shouldn't say an eighth, they'll vary a sixteenth of an inch, but I think that's just in the material that's out there on the edge that we're measuring against. But uh, as far as the measurement that we use is always five and a quarter. I believe we've always ran four quarts in the rear end. You go down on the amount. Um, I wouldn't. I mean, the rear end definitely needs to have the, the normal amount of grease in the rear end, or normal normal amount of oil in the rear end to keep the rear end cool, and and you know it's going through an awful lot of stress the way it is. Well, we've got just a few more minutes here. If we've got any other questions, uh, once again, the stock car schools this weekend. If anybody wants to join us, you're sure welcome to. Uh, and we still have some seats available there. And uh, you know, next weekend, was it next weekend? Oh, in two weeks. In two weeks, we'll be up there at Chad's deal at, at the Mayo Center. And um, then in three weeks, we'll be in Pennsylvania. And, oh, God, I hope for good weather out here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, DR, yeah, I agree with that, Nick. There's no doubt. DR bearings are worth the money. There's no, those spacers, in my opinion, they're one of the best things that they've ever invented in racing. Because what happens is, now, all of a sudden, with that spacer, our two bearings become one instead of having the load, you know, because if you don't have the bearing spacer in there, the load, uh, like the right front, the load's all pretty much on the outside or on the inside bearing. And then the way you have to clamp it down, you're clamping it down trying to, to, to get it as tight as you can, but let's but still have free will. And the problem with that is, is the spacers put that in there so you can tighten them things down as tight as you want them to have it. And in fact, we just actually done a new video uh, that will have, uh, uh, I don't know when we're going to have it published. It should be online here in another week or so, uh, how to do that bearing spacer on the right front. So definitely... Yeah, I that's that and low friction bearings are well worth uh, the money, in my opinion. Anything that's low friction is speed. And what do we do for speed? We spend tons and tons and tons of money on speed. Yeah, Joel just popped on. Yep, looking forward to coming out there. Uh, we can't wait. We'll be out there, like I said, it's 15th and 16th. Yeah, 15th and 16th, we'll be out there at Close Racing Supply in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And looking forward to that. Joel's got an awesome place out there. Uh, we're actually holding it at his shop this time. And the other times we've always had it in town at a facility. We're actually going to do it at Joel's shop, so that's exciting. And, and uh, that works real well. That's kind of how we do our schools at BHE is they're uh, actually all in our shop. With the new stock car ride height rule, what would be a good starting point, or is it is it more load numbers than than that you use? Um, 
I wish I had a little bit more knowledge on the starting point as far as with these ride heights, you know, um, until we actually get racing a little bit more around here. We raced down there in, in Yuma, and I know some of the stock car guys have been racing pretty good, uh, but I, I've not been in touch with any of the stock car guys to know what they're actually doing with the new ride heights. I definitely think load numbers is a key, and that's, that's something that you're definitely going to want to look at is the load number for sure. Uh, Steve, IMCA Sport Mud, how far beneath the axle tube you run the rear control arm on the rear end? Um, well, let's see. What's your bottom measurement on your left rear? Five inches? Five and a half. Five and a half. And then the right rear would be four is what we use. So five and a half under uh, on an IMCA sport mode. Five and a half, uh, five and a half on the left side and four on the right side. So sometimes we go to four and a half on the right side if uh, on a real heavy type racetrack, but on a slicker, especially with an open motor, a slicker racetrack, uh, we run that a little higher. You missed Brady Gertis. Brady? Oh, Brady. Uh, Brady, sorry about that. What's your opinion on an upside-down brake floater on the left rear? Um, what do you know about that, Chad? I'm still waiting for people to tell me it's magic. It doesn't make sense to me, but they're saying it pulls the left rear underneath the car instead of pulling the chassis down, which when you apply brake pressure, it's trying to pull the chassis down. They're saying it's pulling the left rear under. I don't know. I have trouble wrapping my head around it because the, the hub's still spinning in the same direction. The brake caliper grabs. It should pull the chassis down, but they're saying that the brake is sucking it underneath the car. Still haven't got a lot of feedback on that. Uh, some guys are pretty fast with it. but Yeah, definitely. I know some guys that are running that are pretty quick. Uh problem is is the guys that are running it that are pretty quick would probably be running pretty quick with a standard brake floater so yeah uh, i i mean it it isn't an industry trend where everybody's going to it um so i haven't paid as much attention to it as what i probably should have definitely something that a guy should try Well, we had a short evening tonight. It's 8 o'clock. If there's any other questions, feel free to pop in here. Otherwise, we're going to probably go right at 8 or shortly after. Um, we'll, we'll wait here for just a little bit in case there is a couple extra questions. Since we didn't get started on time. You see that Les just popped in and Butch? Uh, Um, less torque length versus torque arm. Your opinion on both torque arm length and spring with preload. Um, we don't actually get a lot of information on the torque arm um, due to the fact that it's illegal in IMCA. Uh, torque link definitely, in my opinion, has more traction. It's quicker traction. Now, the car with a torque arm is going to be more stable. Um, and if you're on racetracks that have a lot of momentum, that torque arm is going to be good. And if you're on a stop and go type racetrack, the torque, it's hard to beat the instant traction that a torque link has. Uh, the torque arm length, you know, depending on what you're running, any, any, the same length as what we actually run the torque links. 30 to 36 inches long, and uh, probably, I'm guessing, but I'm going to say a 250-pound spring to a 300-pound spring uh, with not a lot of preload on it. Can you explain the toe-out 
on the lower link on a sport mod. Um, well, the reason we, well, we actually tow the, if you're talking about the lower links, the trading on links, the reason we tow them in is, is so that it kind of creates a, a certain amount of rear steer too. But the big thing is, is when the car goes back in, it goes into dynamic, we want the right rear to maintain being straight. So we only tow it in an inch and the left rear we tow in two inches. Um, just because we want to make sure that the, those bars always tow in under acceleration and under dynamic mode. You got some data there? Yeah, you don't want them to tow out, so you don't want the, the fronts to pull out. I don't know if you can see it real good on that, but if you look oh, at Oh, yeah, you can see it good. Yeah. You know, you want the front of the bar pointed towards the center of the car, not towards the door. Yeah, and we basically tow in, like I said, the right rear toes in an inch, and the left rear toes in two inches. All right, well, another great night. We'll be back here uh, March 4th, and uh, hopefully we'll have our computer. Back to the right page. God, I hope so. Man, man. Just every time I turn this thing on on Monday nights, I just I, I I pray and then I say to myself, God, I hope this works. But anyway, I never said I was a computer genius. Nope, don't don't understand that and don't have much patience for it. Hi, Todd. Glad you were watching tonight. I appreciate that. I always enjoy knowing that you're out there and seeing what you guys are doing. I hope you're getting ready to go racing here pretty soon and getting the race car all tuned up and ready to go. So anyway, thanks again, everybody, for watching. Sorry about the difficulties. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, everybody.